Hello and welcome everybody. Um, on behalf of Palcos and the Portuguese uh, US Chamber of Commerce, uh, we'd like to, um, we're very pleased to have you all here. This event is part of a series of um, Meet the Artist to uh, celebrate Portuguese American artists in the US and has been set up in the context of a gallery, an online gallery showcasing um, these artists in the US that we started in October and which has been supported by the Embassy of Portugal in Washington, as well as FLAD. Tonight we'll be meeting Jeff Floyd Weber, who will share his art and creative process and take questions. So our format will be, you know, we invite participants to put their questions in the Q&A and any comments that you have on the chat box. We are also uh, live streaming on Facebook and Facebook viewers are also able to put their questions to our artists tonight. The event is being recorded and will be available for viewing later as well in the next few days. My co-host today, I'm excited to say, is um, Jordan Thomas, a very accomplished young man. Uh, Jordan is a Palkus director, a Rhodes Scholar, and a 2018 graduate of Princeton University, where he concentrated in public and international affairs and received dual uh, certificates in Portuguese language and culture and in Af African American studies. Jordan has been a member of Palkus since he was honored with the organization's Promesa Award in 2018. In 2020, he was invited to join the Balkus Board of Directors, and he is uh, leading, um, sorry, representing the next generation of uh, Portuguese Americans, and he is leading the launch of Palkus Next Generation Leadership Academy, a fellowship for the personal and professional advancement of young Portuguese Americans who have demonstrated outstanding promise and are passionate about the celebration and preservation of Portuguese language and culture in the United States. So without any more, I invite Jordan to introduce our artist tonight and uh, who will um, share his work with us and look forward to a lively conversation. Please feel free to with your questions to Jeff. Thank you. Thank you, Magda. And, and on, on behalf of Palkus, we just want to thank you again for your incredible partnership. You've really been involved in this Meet the Artist series from the beginning, as you mentioned, going back to our uh, virtual conference in October. And it's really blossomed into this beautiful regular occurrence with so many Portuguese American artists who we've managed to now spotlight. And, and Jeff, just so excited to have you. Just a bit about the artist here for, for those of you joining us. Jeffrey Lloyd Dever holds a BS degree in fine art from Atlantic Union College, 1976. He is the founding partner and creative director of Dever Designs in Silver Spring, Maryland. He served on the contract and adjunct faculty of Maryland Institute College of Art in Baltimore, Maryland for 20 years, where he taught illustration and graphic design. Sought after as an instructor, he has taught classes across North America and in Europe. He enjoys sharing his pioneering techniques with others as often as his schedule allows. Mr. Dever's polymer clay vessels, jewelry, and sculptural objects have been shown in many national invitational exhibitions, and his works are represented in numerous private collections, galleries, and museums. And of just a fun fact about Jeff is that he is 100% Portuguese, but he has actually never traveled to Portugal. Uh, he will be spending some time there very soon, actually, as part of a trip that he is taking to France. He, he, he recognized that it's a beautiful opportunity now to stop in the motherland. Uh, but, but he does feel strongly Portuguese, despite not having been there yet. And, and he is now the latest in, in one of many uh, inspiring Portuguese American artists who we have highlighted on our online Portuguese American art gallery. Uh, so I do encourage all of you, if you have not had a chance to see the online gallery, please do visit online. You will see many of, of Jeff's works that he will share with us here, and you will see a, a wonderful exhibition of some of our other artists as well. But we are immensely grateful tonight to focus on the beautiful works of, of Jeff 
And, and we are just so looking forward to a wonderful discussion of his artwork, his motivation and his creative process. So without further ado, it is truly an honor and a pleasure now to turn it over to Jeffrey Lloyd Dever to walk us through some of your wonderful, wonderful work. Thank you. Thank you, Jordan, for that uh, introduction and Magda from making this whole thing happen. I, uh, I, I really appreciate you hosting me this evening and I'm looking forward to the opportunity to share my work and, and, and my background. Um, I do have a slideshow to share with you, but first uh, a little bit about my background. Many of the artists who have already uh, been part of the Meet, this Meet the Artist series uh, have either been born in, lived in, travel regularly to Portugal. Uh, I am an anomaly. I'm a third generation American and my grandparents and parents were 100% Portuguese, but uh, I have never had the pleasure of going there as of yet. Uh, I was born in uh, Massachusetts. My uh, paternal grandfather was a stowaway at the age of 14 and landed, I'm not sure, due to family lore, either in New Bedford or Boston. And the name was De Vargas, not Dever, as Dever is a uh, more of a British name. But there had been a governor Dever. And like so many who migrated to the United States in that era, uh, his name was changed as he landed in the States. Hence, my name is Dever. Uh, I at the age of two, my parents moved away from Taunton, Massachusetts, where I was uh, born, uh, to get uh, us an education, my brothers, my two older brothers and I, an education that they had not uh, been privileged to, to receive. So they sold their farm in Taunton and moved to South Lancaster, Massachusetts, a little small town in the center of the state. And there I went first grade through college uh, in a parochial school system, the Seventh-day Adventist school system, and, uh, and graduated there. One of my early mentors, uh, my parents ran a corner grocery store and lunch counter and made friends with many of the students. So when the art education and education majors uh, were required to take a uh, class teaching art for their certification, they invited local children in. And at the age of, I think I was probably five or six, I was invited to participate. Uh, thoroughly enjoyed it, but the professor of the department, a Dr. Mabel Bartlett, uh, came over and tapped me on the shoulder and said, how would you like to come play with some oil paints? And she took me from the group into another room, gave me a smock and, and rolled up the sleeves so I, my hands would be free and allowed me to play with a box of oil paints and canvas. And Dr. Bartlett was still there when I took my freshman art history course as a professor emeritus. So she was a lifelong friend and I, I credit her with uh, being a part of what led me into the arts. Um, I've been a maker since I was a young child. My parents had drawings uh, labeled age four and I've probably drawn every day of my life since then. Uh, and after college, I studied fine art, but after college, I chose to go into graphic design because my uh, guidance counselor in high school actually uh, tried to dissuade me from art, saying that math and physics were my uh, strong suits. I asked him again about art and he said, well, I just don't see it here. Uh, but perhaps I believe that led me to the, uh, how I chose to express my art because graphic design is essentially uh, a left and right brain uh, discipline. And, and I think that's what appeals to me. I really need for anything I create, the motivation of a problem seeking a solution. And whether that was in my uh, graphic design, my illustration, teaching, or in now my art in polymer, 
uh, I think that's a common thread through, through all of these. No matter how I expressed my art, I always think of it as a problem seeking a solution. Uh, so with that, that's, that's my background. And I have a slideshow that I think will help illustrate and I can talk us through uh, what exactly my medium is because it's not easily discernible on uh, uh, first looking at that. So let me go ahead here, if you'll give me just a moment and I'll share my screen. Let me know, let me undo that. This is what I wanna do. Excuse me one second. This worked so smoothly a minute ago. There we go. Can everyone see this? Not yet, Jeff. Not yet? Let me try it again. How about now? Great. We can see it? Okay. Uh, this here, all my work is sculptural in nature at this stage. Uh, I like to think of it as painting and drawing in three dimensions. What you're looking at here is a detail of an illustration I did for the Fuller, uh, an installation I did, excuse me, for the Fuller Craft Museum uh, in Brockton, Massachusetts, which was really lovely because it's within a half hour of where I was born. So it was an honor to go back there and do the first of uh, several installations I have done. You'll notice that all these elements are individual little sculptural objects. This installation, which was called Edensong Reverie, had 57 separate pieces. But the colors you see here are the actual colors of the material. These are not uh, carved out of wood or glazed or painted. They, that is the actual color of the material. This here uh, is a view of the uh, work area of my studio, which is behind me. And uh, it's not, it's a compact studio, but I'm able to, uh, because of the, the processes I go through, which require stage after stage of sculpting, fabricating, curing, uh, and detailing, um, pieces can take weeks to finish sometime. In the foreground in this piece, on the lower right, you'll see a series of gray uh, forms there. That is, those are brooches in progress that have been sculpted over a reinforced armature. I am known for two signature techniques in this medium, one of which is reinforced armatures, which allows uh, me to create things that the material uh, really shouldn't do, very thin areas that would break otherwise. But one day while sitting at a stoplight, I saw people pouring concrete for Jersey barriers. And you've all seen rods of rebar, steel rebar in concrete. Well, the same principle is what works here. The polymer clay, that gray polymer clay, has a good compaction strength, but not a good torsional strength. So with a wire and, and armature fabricated inside, uh, it is able to endure longitudinal stresses. And the material itself sculpted over this uh, is good for compression. On the left-hand side, you see some of my other work, a basket, a teapot, uh, a small box uh, that I'll share with you. But here I'm working on a, a piece uh, that had some 100 and almost 150 blossom petals. And this is the piece here. This is called, um, what is the name of that? Eden's Promise. It's a neck piece. And it was recently uh, published uh, in the Society of North American Goldsmiths annual jewelry survey and was one of their top picks. But you saw me in the previous slide 
affixing all these little petal pods, uh, which were in nine different colors. Those had to be individually rolled, cured, drilled, stem mounted, and then mounted on a central pod to create this. Next is a piece, this is a bracelet called Summer Opulence. And this is in the permanent collection of the Boston Museum of uh, Fine Arts. Again, uh, you see, I, I put a lot of detail. I, li I like, uh, it's if I don't suffer enough for my work, it's not completed. So I, I spend a lot of time on, on detail. This piece here is a stick pin style brooch. Uh, and it is uh, part of the Racine Art Museum, Ram's permanent uh, art collection. This is called Blossoming Red Eye. Next is another brooch called As Summer Pales. But within these pieces are those structural elements uh, that we saw in, the, in gray form uh, on my, the front of my studio desk. This piece here is called Lyric Eden. And uh, last year, the Society of North American Goldsmiths was forced to cancel their annual conference. Uh, they are holding it this coming year, this coming summer in Philadelphia. And in conjunction with that, uh, In Liquid Gallery there will be hosting a Goldsmith 20 exhibition. And this piece is one of the uh, selected pieces. This is another brooch, Star Blossom Epiphany. And again, you see my passion for detail. This here represents the two techniques very well. Um, the green pods here, this is a, a necklace uh, that is called Tropic Tableau. And you'll notice that the green pods have, they thin down in the middle and they would snap like a twig if they were just made of the material. So there's a wire armature, hence my reinforced armature technique. The two blossom pods, if you will, you'll notice they're hollow inside. You can see the open end on the pod. Uh, those are built over a form and that's my hollow form technique. The form is then removed and these color veneers that you see, that gradient color is applied one side at a time and cured each time. The dots, uh, the spots there are impressed into the raw clay, cured, backfilled with a contrasting color clay, cured yet again. Then the center of those spots is drilled out, filled with another color, cured again. So pieces like this can easily go through 15 or more uh, fabrication, sculpting, and curing cycles. This piece here is called uh, Tropic Eden. Uh, this represents one of my uh, necklace techniques where I work with magnets. You'll notice you don't see a catch or a finding for the piece here because where the final blossom overlaps the water uh, section of this, there is tiny magnets embedded in each of them. And that blossom sets into a cradle held by a magnet. This is particularly uh, easy for people who have uh, trouble with uh, fine little catches and, uh, and findings. Uh, the cable here is made by another fellow artist, uh, Chris Hentz, and he makes them out of anodized niobium, which I then modify to accommodate uh, this type of uh, magnetic closure. A, some of a somewhat of a companion bracelet. This was a commission piece after the person saw that necklace. Uh, they asked me to uh, make this bracelet, which is called Siren Keys. Again, this is over a reinforced armature because the material itself would not be able to stand up to the rigors of being a bracelet. Uh, I was asked for a number of years to make earrings and I, um, I put it off because earrings are twice as much work. They may be small, but you're doing twice, uh, you're doing multiples. And uh, so I started a few years ago and earrings have proven to be one of my most popular uh, pieces. 
This is a one of a kind pair that is called August Eden. And again, these are made over uh, a reinforced armature. The spots are drilled. Each of those leaves are layered one at a time and cured. So again, uh, multiple stages of fabrication and curing. Now these are hollow form uh, using my hollow form technique and these are called tropic blooms. Uh, so I do a number of what I would call mirror image earrings, but I also do like I showed in the last pair, a uh, the, uh, what would I say, mismatched pairs. I'm very fond of mismatched pairings. This is another one called Desert Secrets. Uh, it was inspired by a trip to Southern California one spring when it had been a particularly wet spring and the desert was just lush with blossoms. This is a teapot. Um, it's not a functional teapot. There are art teapot collectors who collect a wide array of teapots that are defined only by having a teapot body, a spout, a handle, and a lid. A little blossom there is the lid. The little appendage is the handle, and you see the spout. This is a morning refuge. These, I started down this path with the teapots at the behest of a gallery, Del Mano Gallery in Los Angeles, which, uh, which I worked with. And uh, they asked me, do you make tea? Have you ever made a teapot? And I hadn't, but I responded that I would love to. And I really appreciate the challenge uh, that people give me. And uh, Del Mano, which no longer exists, sadly, um, challenged me several times in, in the range of work I make. Uh, for instance, they were the first people to challenge me to uh, do sculptural basketry. This piece is called Serendipity. Uh, it was in response to a, uh, a call by the Blue Spiral Gallery in Asheville, North Carolina, and it features my tinkered wire uh, wrapped basketry and uh, of course the polymer sculptural elements that uh, work in tandem uh, with it. Once again, uh, Del Mano Gallery uh, asked me, they said, we have a annual show with collector art teaspoons. Who knew there was such a thing? And they asked me if I would participate, if I would be interested. Uh, this is called Tea with Eve. And the bowl of the spoon is created with my hollow form technique, while the handle is made with my reinforced armature technique. Uh, I've also done a number of collaborations, which is very interesting to play off the synergy of another individual. Uh, a friend of ours who is a painter and does a lot of uh, botanical subject matter, uh, she had expressed an interest in doing something that was uh, less naturalistic, a little more stylized. So we planned together and uh, came up with this piece. This is called Exuberance, a triptych interrupted. And you'll notice that some of my forms are actually mounted on the surface of her paintings and they spill over the edges. And then of course the interruption is this uh, burst of piece, sculptural pieces uh, that I have done. And you'll notice the longer uh, pods that have seeds inside of them, those are actually trapped in there. These are built in such a way that things aren't mounted in there. They're actually just trapped in there. And this is a combination of reinforced armature and hollow form technique. Another cl collaboration is this uh, vest with what I call a pin installation, which is a miniature installation of pins. Uh, the artist, Teresa Marie Wittick, uh, is a wool felt uh, wearables artist. And looking at her work, I was intrigued by the colors and, and the design of her pieces. So we took uh, one of her existing designs and together collaborated and ha uh, had her make a custom one for me, modified slightly. And then I made the companion installation 
which this is a detail of here on the lapel. The thing I love about these pin installations is that theoretically, uh, the person, the collector or the owner of this piece could rearrange them in any number of ways, uh, like playing with Legos almost. This is called Splash, the Coral Intersanctum. Again, another brooch uh, with, is inspired by almost a fantasy that this coral inner sanctum beneath the waves existed uh, as if some superhero would retreat there. This is creme d'orange and uh, it has a feel of, all, many people comment when they see this that it feels like it's lit from inside and it's luminous. It's purely an optical trick with the gradations, but each of those little pod branches is layered one at a time over the sculptural inner uh, piece and cured. So a piece like this, again, is easily cured 12 to 15 times. This is um, buttercream, excuse me, buttercream dawn. Uh, this is a hollow form piece. And again, the blue uh, moon, if you will, is trapped in there. And, and I think of this piece as uh, it's influenced by uh, when I did an art residency, artist residency up at the Haystack Mountain School of Craft in Deer Isle, Maine. And in the morning, it, that is one of the furthest, most Eastern points in the United States and where the sun is arguably first seen on the continental United States. So this represents for me the daylight coming, the sun coming and, and rising and devouring the receding moon, almost Pac-Man style. I strayed a bit from my naturalistic work a few years back, experimenting with some new things. Uh, under the influence, I would say a fusion of modern art, uh, mid-century design, uh, with a little bit of a Asian aesthetic uh, sprinkled in. This was one of the first pieces, and this is a brooch called Kinesis. Uh, you can see from the previous pieces and these ensuing pieces, I'm rather fond of the pin mechanism being part of the final design. I don't hide them most of the time. Next is a pendant neck piece. Uh, this is called Fireflies at Dusk. And I imagine one of those fiery red sunsets we see sometimes and the fireflies dancing in the, in the evening glow, lighting up intermittently. So fireflies at dusk. Next is Black Moon Orbit. This is uh, a combination of hollow form and my reinforced armature. Uh, and again, the pin back features prominently. Another magnet uh, type of pendant where the red and the white pods each have a magnet in them and a little saddle for the red pod to sit in that holds them securely. This is chance encounter. Next is counter intuitive a hollow form and reinforced armature brooch. A, in the similar style, this is kinship, a pair of mismatched earrings uh, that for me symbolize the idea that there's so many different types of people in the world, uh, be it racially, gender, age, uh, but there is, there can be a harmony between them, even in their differences. This was based on a song from my childhood, Catch a Falling Star. This is a brooch. This piece here is called Fiesta Moderne. And uh, it, coincidentally, uh, literally 15 minutes before we started this uh, Meet the Artist this evening, I just got the notification that this has sold. 
This is landscape tangerine. And these last few pieces have a very kind of modernistic feel to them. Um, the Racine Art Museum in 2011 did a major exhibition and became the archive for historical polymer works. They also did a book called Terra Nova, Polymer Art at the Crossroads, which anyone who wants to learn more about the history of polymer uh, and polymer art uh, can, uh, can buy either through RAM or on Amazon. Uh, but in there, there's a series of essays uh, and many, many pictures and illustrations. And, and Bruce Pep Pepich, the executive director and curator of collections there, uh, described my work as work that looked like it came from a Jetsons uh, era. And I, I can just see the cartoon Jetsons uh, in this, and it, it almost feels like their universe. So this is landscape tangerine. This last year has been a troubling year for, for many of us. And uh, the next three pieces are a response to some of the dueling issues that we have faced. This piece here is called Reunion, United We Stand. And for me, it abstractly depicts on the left-hand side, the blue dots representing the COVID virus just everywhere and invasive. And on the right-hand side, it represents the artificial stratified layers of society and, and the, the Black Lives Matter and racial disparities we were dealing with. And the center portal, uh, the orange, is a pathway through to a more optimistic uh, future. This piece comes apart. It's a magnet piece. And that portal to a more optimistic and hopeful future only comes together when they're reunited. So that's reunion, united we stand. Next is a brooch called Nemesis. And uh, hopefully you recognize it as a stylization of a coronavirus. And the arched pin back was, this was done right about the time we were beginning to see the rise and fall in the numbers, depending on how people were responding to cooperating with uh, fighting this disease. And uh, this is Nemesis. The next one is Remonstrance for Justice. Uh, this was done about the time George Floyd uh, was killed. Uh, this piece here was originally uh, named Remonstrance for George. I changed the name when this was just too prevalent an occurrence in our society today. And I felt to singularly call it Remonstrance for George was a disservice to the others who had also been killed. Uh, here again, on the left-hand side, the representation of the stratifications, uh, socioeconomic, racial, and otherwise in our society. And on the right-hand side is representation abstractly of the flames that occurred from the riots afterwards and the embers rising in the air. For me, the fiber on the upper right-hand side and the singed quality of it at its end uh, represents uh, people of privilege, myself included, who are complicit in this at some level. This is remonstrance for justice. Finally, coming down the home stretch here, this is ephemeral muse. And this is a combination piece, a torque style necklace with the tinkered wire basketry and my polymer forms. Uh, and this is in the permanent collection of the uh, Philadelphia Museum of Art. Next is a teapot seekers sojourn. Uh, this was uh, purchased by a board member of uh, the Re former board member of the Renwick Museum. And I got to hand deliver it to her, which was a real honor, where she showed me her vast collection uh, that she and her husband had amassed. And uh, I tell you, I am the penny candy in their beautiful collection. And finally, Jardin Nouveau. This is a sculptural basket 
Uh, I have always been fascinated with Art Nouveau and the dancing fluid lines uh, of these blossoms uh, really remind me of a Art Nouveau garden depicted in a sculptural form. So that's it for me. If you'd like to see more, it's just my name dot uh, com for my website. All right. I'm not sure how we get back to. Here we go. There we Great. go. Great. Thank you so much, Jeff, for um, this very extensive um, collection of your art pieces. Um, they are fascinating. Um, actually, while I was watching you go through this, I, I, I kind of, the thing that struck me is that there was a certain familiarity with some of these shapes and I just realized what they are. In Portugal, in the Algarve, they have these very delicious, extremely sweet marzipan little um, things, which are, you know, usually they are fruits or a little fish or flowers or something like that. And, um, you know, it just made me very hungry. <laughs> It's funny. It's funny you mentioned that, Magda, because uh, at one of the conferences that uh, a polymer conference, international polymer conference, uh, that was held in Baltimore, actually, there's a company there called the Ace of Cakes, and they were asked to build us a celebratory cake for the conference. And they took about a half a dozen artists whose style was recognizable, and they sculpted out of fondant and frosting and cake, their pieces. And uh, one of my blossom pods from a familiar pin uh, was one of them that they depicted. Uh, so edibles, I can see how that would uh, come across <laughs> that way. It's also, you know, there's some, uh, there's a, in New York, there's a Japanese um, sort of sweet shop that has some things that are also, you know, so I don't know if it's the time of the day or what it was, but, you know, suddenly it clicked on me. Where have I seen something um, that, you know, draws from nature, but, and it has a sort of say, similar shapes. But um, one question that I had for you and um, is polymer clay is like an alternative material that is being used in jewelry making. Um, so what staggered your interest in, in this material or what particular characteristics attracted you to it? In a word, color. Okay. Uh, I'm a colorist by nature, even though I love doing things that are stark and black and white and, and that type of thing also, and grays. But basically I'm a colorist by nature. And I think of polymer clay and it comes in little blocks by a number of different manufacturers in a variety of colors. I think of uh, that as three-dimensional paint. So I can paint in space. And uh, what attracted me to it, I had, uh, I've always had more than one job. And while I was working as an art director, I uh, had a business called Fresh Art that did illustration. And uh, one year I just had reached a point where I said, I'm not gonna do it anymore. So I stopped. And about a year later, I went into a store while buying supplies for our design studio. And there were two college students there demonstrating this material, you know, making simple little things, rolling snakes and beads and things like this out of it and demonstrating it. Well, I was so captivated by it that I bought one of each color uh, and a new book at the time called The New Clay by Nan Roach, who is, uh, was a uh, scientist at NIH, uh, was a book exploring, it was, I call it the Old Testament of uh, polymer clay in which she described techniques and artists. And this just opened up a whole world for me. Uh, but initially, I started doing whimsical three-dimensional illustration with this. And it was only after being exposed to the broader community and seeing the possibilities of what people could do 
uh, that I started working on my own techniques. Uh, I'm stubborn by nature and refuse to take any workshops because I wanted to come up with my own direction. And so as I described, the reinforced armature techniques grew out of seeing them pour concrete. And the hollow form techniques came out of watching a program on television of them making fiberglass boats over molds. And uh, I said, let's try that with polymer. So that's, that's how it all uh, started. I, and then this has been about uh, 25 years or more ago. Uh, that this I started on this path, and uh, it's just been a passion ever since. Although uh, I do fear sometimes that I'll do the same thing as I've done in illustration, which is reach a point where I'm done. But when I look at my files of sketches, uh, I don't think I'm going to run out or be bored of uh, things to pursue. So that takes me to two questions. One is from the audience. And it, he asked, Richard or Osborne asked, is this a full-time passion of yours? So maybe we go to that one because you just talked about passion. It's, it's a good, good question. Um, no, it, 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 well, now it's close to a full-time. Uh, I retired, uh, well, semi-retired, mostly retired about a year ago. Um, I was planning to retire, but the cancellation of some big projects uh, at the last minute, I, I had planned to retire after them, um, allowed me, uh, I don't feel like I'm victimized by it, but allowed me to retire a little early. So we have kept one client that I've had for over 25 years, a magazine client. And, uh, but otherwise, my full time pursuit is, is my art. And uh, my wife will tell you, uh, if I have a day without coming to my studio, uh, I'm incomplete. I, I probably put in more hours or the same number of hours now with my hobby as I do with, uh, uh, what, as I did with my job. Uh, so it, it is a consuming passion. And I think it gets back to those early childhood days of just wanting to be a maker. Uh, I am, however, an analog animal in a digital world. And uh, I'm in danger, therefore, an endangered species of uh, becoming extinct as the world becomes more and more digital. But I still need the tactile feel of material in my hands uh, to, to get full benefit and my, my most pleasure from it. So Jeff, you just told us that you have um many, many, many drawings and sketches, okay? So um, it's that, that's how you start the process or do you just play with it and come up with a shape? Um, well, there certainly is spontaneity in the process, but virtually everything starts with an idea uh, I think of it as visual note-taking with a sketch. Uh, when I teach workshops and when I taught at uh, MICA, uh, when I taught uh, design students, I made them start with sketches. And sketching intimidates people. But what's good about it, if you don't think about the perfection of the sketch, but merely as a way to explore and lock an idea in your head, it's much the same as taking notes in college. When you took notes and wrote things down, uh, you retained them better. And sketching has that same uh, process for me. Uh, my sketches these days are not in a beautiful bound sketchbook, but they're on scraps of paper. When an idea pops into my head, wherever I am, I jot it down. Uh, I date them. And at the end of every year, I throw them into a folder. And it may be five, 10 years before I go back to an idea. Uh, sometimes the idea comes before I even know how to make it. And later on, it will come. But uh, anyone who wants to be a creative, um, I personally, my point of view, and I respect those who don't go through this process, but I think sketching helps us to visually articulate 
what we're trying to end up with. Uh, and it is not uh, something that inhibits us being spontaneous while in process. It doesn't need to, you know, we can be both uh, at the same time. Um, do you sometimes halfway through change the shape and, uh, and end up with something a little different than you were expecting? <laughs> uh, I think that's what I'm, I'm talking about with the spontaneity there. I will edit and amend uh, a piece in process. Now, uh, there are certain degrees to which I can do that, but because of the structural limitations, uh, I, it, without pre-planning, certain things can't be done because this material has structural limitations to it. Uh, but yes, I certainly, uh, with color, with pattern, uh, I am constantly uh, editing and amending uh, in process. And my sketches uh, along that line, my sketches are black and white. They're not color because color is something that does happen spontaneously as the piece speaks to me. Mm -hmm. And indeed, uh, communicating with a piece is often uh, a piece that's finished will have to sit around uh, for a few days uh, before I feel the final title emerges. Uh, an example of that is, a, is a, a bracelet I've got here. This is the first time I'm showing it to anybody. It hasn't even been documented in photography yet. I don't even have a title for it, but it's a bracelet with magnets. So this will sit around on my desk for a while till I get it photographed. And I've got some notes of where, what it might be titled, uh, but the title and the colors that were applied here uh, happened while in process. So we have... Um... A question here on the Q&A. Did you try to use other materials for your sculptures and designs or you've stayed true to Paula McClure? Um, I have stayed, I, I have used other materials. Indeed, uh, at two different conferences, uh, I gave, actually three, I gave a, a series of three lectures over several years uh, called Immaterial. An immaterial was, it was presented to polymer community at conferences, uh, was uh, trying to get people who were polymer purists to envision everything in their world as a potential material. So between those three lectures, I made uh, close to 200 pieces out of ephemeral materials. Everything from macaroni to Q-tips to old bicycle tubes, uh, and, and made all kinds of pieces. It's really, it was really an interesting process for me. And to try to get people to just think creatively. Uh, but I am still primarily attracted to polymer out of a loyalty to an artist uh, named Elise Winters. Elise Winters uh, was an artist who started a project called the Polymer Collection Project. And it was an effort to get polymer accepted into the wider range uh, in the art world. And um, our, our, my medium only has a history that goes back to the 30s or 40s, depending on who you talk to. So it doesn't have a history like ceramic or glass or, or wood. And uh, it is perceived because it was marketed as uh, at one point a child's modeling compound. Uh, it was perceived as a not serious material. So my quest is to honor the legacy of Elise. And I have tried to get this material uh, accepted in the broader community. And it has, uh, my work, I don't sell a lot of work, but my work has been published quite widely. Uh, I've been honored to be included in many invitational uh, exhibitions, including the Beijing Biennial uh, a few years back, which uh, I, I actually thought was a scam when I got the email requesting my work. Uh, I had to do some research and contact other international art jewelries to say, is this a real thing? And, uh, and, and that kind of recognition and the pieces I mentioned that are now being shown and accepted 
by the Society of North American Goldsmiths, who I am a uh, member of, um, says something about the gradual acceptance of this medium. And that's what I'm hoping uh, will happen. Because for me, uh, I am driven by making things that only have a value because of the vision of the artist. Nothing I've ever made has a material value of more than a, you know, a few dollars. And, uh, and I really am attracted to that because then it's about my vision, my blood, sweat, and tears put into the piece that make it uh, have a value. That is not to be disparaging of anyone working in precious materials. Uh, I value what they do and, and I honor that. Uh, and I honor the people who are patient to work in a, you know, and, and refine their skill over and over across their career. Uh, I'm too impatient and I'm a bit of a chameleon, but I am pretty much at this point a loyalist to at least primarily the polymer and introduce anecdotally other materials as I go. So we have a question uh, here, which I think in part you have answered, but maybe you'd like to expand on it. Beside Art Nouveau, what are your major influences or design inspirations? Oh boy, <laughs> have you got an hour? Uh, <laughs> I, uh, you can see from my, my work that nature plays a huge role uh, you also probably have recognized that with the word Eden and Eve and that showing up in a number of the titles, I am also uh, fascinated with the, uh, the metaphor of Eden and, uh, and that fascinates me. So nat the natural world uh, is a spiritual thing to me and, and, and that speaks to much of my work. Uh, but I have many other influences. The newer work, like I say, I am fascinated by modern art. Uh, I really appreciate people who do simple, elegant things. And I have the hardest time in the world restraining myself to do something that is simple and, and elegant. But I, but I appreciate it. And that's uh, why some of the newer work that is, uh, from my perspective, at the intersection of modern art uh, and mid-century design it, uh, fascinates me too. I think a lot of it is very kitschy, so I try to avoid that. But uh, that and uh, Asian art, uh, Japanese art in particular, really uh, fascinate me too. So um, uh, there's, there's many, many things though. Uh, uh, sometimes I'm materially driven. Uh, to, to pursue something. So um, I think I must be a little bit ADHD because I just, uh, uh, in spite of how long I will spend on a piece, I'm not the most patient person uh, and, uh, and, and I'm driven on to the next thing. So I guess it's good that I work in stages on my pieces because if I had to work for a uh, hundred hours straight on something, I probably... Uh, wouldn't complete it. <laughs> well, Jeff, I don't think that uh, uh, impatient is one of your uh, uh, personality traits because <laughs> from the work <laughs> I've seen, you know, this requires enormous patience and, you know, a lot of method and discipline. But um, one question I also had for you, and then I'll well, Jordan, a few questions too, so I don't want to mon monopolize the conversation. But your, the building of your armatures requires, um, you know, metal smithing techniques, or how, how do you bind them together? So this is one of those gray forms for a brooch that you saw on the front of my desk. Mm -hmm. Inside here is a thin wire armature and a cellulose fiber cardstock that is saturated with cyanoacrylate super glue. And what that does, that came from watching people work with fiberglass, where they take a fabric, soak it in you know, fiberglass resin, and it makes a rigid material. So there is a combination armature in here made of that stock 
reinforced with hard, uh, what's called music wire, which is a very okay. strong, stiff wire. It comes in many gauges. And then just like in the reinforced concrete, where they call tying together the rebar and those types of things, I literally tie those elements together, uh, glue and tie them to create an armature over which I create sculpt this piece. So the silhouette of this piece, if you will, okay, let's just hold it like that. The silhouette of that piece is exactly what the armature inside looks like. It follows that shape. And then I sculpt over it. And that's where I was saying earlier that um, there's a degree of modification and spontaneity that happens mid piece. But for a piece like this, for instance, uh, I might be able to amend it with another ball or something. But these main joints here that are thin and tiny, uh, without that reinforced armature inside, would just snap. Uh, an example is the pin I'm wearing, the brooch I'm wearing, mm -hmm. also with these thin little delicate branches and leaves. Uh, without that armature, uh, they wouldn't exist. Does that answer your question? Yes. And this material that you use is um, able to sustain the temperatures of the curing. Curing is a relatively low temperature. It's a, a depending on the brand, it's approximately 275 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, it's short period curing, uh, anywhere from a half hour to 45 minutes each stage. Uh, so it, it, it is a material, uh, it's not like having to fire overnight if you were, say, a ceramic artist mm -hmm. or if you were an enamelist that have to fire for hours uh, to, to get things to, uh, to cure. This cures uh, at a lower temperature and faster. Uh, that's part of the reason it was marketed as a child's sculpting medium, because it's... Uh, to quote one of my uh, artist friends, it, it's infinitely accessible, but the possibilities with it uh, can take a lifetime to master. You know, and I, we can I know. use our home oven. Yes, <laughs> uh, I have a separate oven because people who do a lot of work with this should have uh, dedicated ovens and tools. They should not use this in conjunction with, uh, uh, you know, food surfaces and things like that. Mm -hmm. But yes, that's the idea. Um, Jordan, you had um, a couple of questions that we had chatted over earlier. Yes, uh, and the, the main one, Jeff, is we've talked a lot so far about your the early stages of your creative process, but we haven't talked so much about that final stage, which is the digitization and, and how you go about producing these wonderful images that you were able to walk us through here of those physical objects. I mean, they're, they're so vibrant that the, the very first one that you showed us of you in the studio, uh, when I first saw that in, in our initial conversations, I thought that I was actually looking at you uh, through the Zoom and not, not a digital recreation of one of your artworks. That's how well, well constructed they are. And so uh, I think that it would be wonderful for us to just talk a bit and for our audience to hear how it is that you go about once you have these these physical uh, artworks of yours, then actually creating that digital image that you shared with us. Well, the images are done through traditional photography. Okay. And I am very fortunate to have a photographer who I've worked with for a number of years. Uh, actually, uh, he also uh, shoots uh, Elizabeth Casquero's work also. Okay. His name is Gregory Staley, and he's a fantastic photographer. Uh, photography in the art world is very interesting because uh, there are three levels of photography. Museums will shoot pieces purely as documentary evidence of a piece, and color and detail being preserved is their highest goal. The other end of the spectrum is people who are selling in a commercial market uh, venue or advertising uh, pieces that are mass produced. Uh, they will do what I would call a glamour shot. 
they might have it shot on models or in, you know, with uh, Gaussian filters and hazy, beautifully lit colored lights and things like that uh, to give a piece a bit of sex appeal. Uh, Greg shoots for me in the place in between. I want him to document my work, but give it a little warmth and personality and capture the color. Because again, essentially I see myself as a colorist and Greg has done that masterfully. I owe him a lot. Uh, I'm getting ready to send him uh, another 15 or 16 pieces in the next week or so. And, uh, and he has, uh, yeah, he's just a, a real asset. I think I get, I credit him too with just how fortunate I have been in being invited into uh, various exhibitions, uh, having my work printed in uh, many different publications and books. And I think it's because you start with good photography and Greg's been a real asset. I had one more question. Sorry, Jeff. Have you ever considered mixing um, like precious or semi-precious stones or corals um, with your material? Um, I thought about it and uh, a number of polymer artists do that. Uh, uh, and they do a lot of metal smithing in conjunction with this. And, and part of the acceptance of this medium has been that artists who would not associate themselves with polymer at all uh, are starting to include it as a way of uh, adding color and uh, some drama to their pieces. Uh, for me personally, again, because my personal quest is to try to steer away from precious materials, I haven't. Uh, because I, I think of my work as sculpture that is an outgrowth of my personal uh, aesthetic vision. And so I have, uh, it's a principled point. It's not, you know, I'm not trying to be superior to anybody or, or, or anything like that, but it's just, uh, uh, it's just how I've evolved to uh, at this point. Doesn't never say never. Uh, and indeed, my earrings have silver ear wires, and, uh, and I will use uh, cables and findings where necessary that are, uh, you know, precious materials. But I haven't used any uh, gemstones or anything like that. And I think part, part of that, too, is because increasingly organizations like SNAG, the Society of North American Goldsmiths, are, are wrestling more and more with how and where gold, diamonds, gemstones uh, are procured and harvested and where they come from. And oftentimes uh, in a very exploitive ways, particularly uh, things like, like diamonds uh, can be, uh, diamonds and gold right now are big discussion points in that community. Uh, that's not what keeps me away from them. Uh, I, I agree with staying away from that, but it's, it's more just, uh, I like having no physical value to my piece other than what I imbue it with. Thank you. And I think one, one last question here, Jeff, because I know we're, we're running over time, is, you know, you you've done this really great job of continually adapting and challenging yourself. You mentioned that you had a, a foray into modernism and, and showed us some wonderful pieces on that. And you also just adapt to social context and uh, showed us some of your pieces around justice and around COVID. Um, and so do you, as, as you're currently looking at the next challenge uh, for yourself, do you have a sense of what that might be? Obviously we don't know what what the next social context that we're operating in might be, but just a sense of, you know, stylistic influences or traditions that, that you look and just they've, they've caught your eye for a while, but you haven't quite delved into them yet? Um, I don't have a really good answer for that. Uh, I am a chameleon. I continue to do my naturalistic work and I'll continue to explore the more modern work. Uh, and I could wake up tomorrow morning and see something at a roadside sign or in a magazine that would take me in a new direction. I, I would like to do more pieces that address societal issues without being confrontational. 
we live in such a polarized world that uh, I feel a moral responsibility if I can to uh, comment with my work, but not comment in a way that alienates someone with a different perspective than me. I am a product of my heritage and my, my grandparents and parents, uh, the part of the country I grew up in, New England. And I recognize that my perspectives are formed by having been raised as a person of privilege, you know, uh, a Caucasian in, in, in North America. And um, so I'd like to try to deal with issues, uh, at least give voice and draw attention more than confronting people. Uh, so I, I think that's, some, that's a place my antenna are up. Uh, I, I don't know where that'll go yet. Uh, and I'd also like to, um, I've been working on jewelry quite a bit the last few years, and I'd like to explore getting back to uh, an installation or two. Uh, incidentally, if people are curious about the installations, if they Google my name, uh, there are a couple videos out there of the installations, uh, kind of a time lapse thing showing me installing them uh, that, you know, if anyone is interested in that sort of thing. But uh, no, I don't, have a, I don't have a definitive answer. I do have my collection of sketches, which when I get stumped, I dive into. And, uh, and there's always something there. That's wonderful. I am looking forward though to getting back to teaching workshops. And that's where a year from now, we're hoping COVID will be on the permanent run. And we're planning our trip to uh, teach a workshop in France, uh, which will afford me an opportunity to visit, finally uh, visit Portugal. Well, that's definitely our goal that you do come, do go to Portugal, and um, and we hope at the time to to be able to give you a few ideas, and uh, even hopefully you know organize for you to 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 show some work there or to do a workshop um, through the different contacts that we have. Um, and uh, we would like to thank you very much for your time and for sharing the process, uh, your inspiration, your artwork, um, and invite every American Portuguese artist to visit the gallery and to contact us. And uh, in the audience, if anyone knows or is a Portuguese American artist that would like to, to join, um, it's been very rewarding. We started with five artists, including Jeff, and I think we are around uh, 12 now and a few more that have already contacted us and will be submitting their work. I'll pass it on to Jordan for some closing. And, um, but just before that, we will have another artist, um, meet the session artist, in mid-May. We are aiming to have them in the third week of each month. So stay tuned. Thank you very much, Jeff, from my side. Thank you. Jordan? Magda, and, and again, just thank you, Jeff. Thank you to everybody in the audience. This has been a, a wonderful session, and we hope that everyone really took away some, some great inspiration for those of you who, who are uh, fascinated by this work, and and as Magda mentioned, those of you who may actually produce works of your own, just the the ability to to get such a wonderful portfolio of Jeff's work, we hope certainly inspired you. And uh, if if nothing else, we hope it inspired you to visit some of the links that we have here in the chat for you, whether it's it's Jeff's uh, personal website or Portuguese American Art Gallery, where you can see more of of this wonderful range of work. And as Magda mentioned, we are having these sessions regularly, where we have another one in May and hope to keep them coming uh, every third week of, of the month. And so please join us again, tell, tell your, uh, your friends, tell your family, tell people on your Facebook network and other networks about this, uh, this wonderful initiative that Palkus is, is hosting uh, with, with Magda and the, the Chamber of Commerce and with artists like Jeff. And uh, we, we really just welcome your continued engagement and those of anyone who you may know. So thank you all for a wonderful evening and we hope to see you all again. 
Thank, thank you, you for very making much. this. Thank you for making this happen. It was wonderful. I appreciate your efforts. Thank, thank you. you. We thank hope you. we'll be able to meet you in person sometime. Yes, please. When traveling when allows. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Thank you. Take care. Bye. -bye. Bye.